particular uh, the question of human rights law and what are the challenges, first of all, before we even look at the interplay between the, the two bodies of law, what are the challenges of human rights law, whether the human rights law substantively uh, has, uh, has within it the ability to regulate some of the situations that arise in, uh, in armed conflict and, and in particular concerns over extraterritorial applicability of human rights law, which does seem to slowly be resolving itself, but uh, there are still questions of how far uh, it, it expands and, and different views. So, so we're highlighting those. Uh, we, we looked at the questions of the legal principles that apply and how one would solve uh, questions and perhaps potentially, in, and as we said, in a minority of situations, contradictions between the two bodies of law and what would be the legal principles used to try and resolve this. And, and we uh, did uh, try and, uh, and, and look to, to the future here. Uh, and then, of course, we also looked at particular issues in relation to detention and use of force. Uh, and highlighting the problems that arise specifically in, in both of these areas uh, using some very concrete examples, uh, but also showing how the, the two bodies of law can work together in these areas and achieve outcomes that are uh, most probably consistent with the, with the aim of the law in both cases. The first question here is why is there actually a problem uh, with, with human rights law in the first place? Okay, so we're not looking here, I'm not, not asking you here about how, do the, uh, how does the interaction work between human rights law and IHL, about legal principles between them, but just, just think about human rights law for a minute. What's the problem with simply saying, you know what, yeah, fine, it's an armed conflict, but we can use human rights law to sort out everything that's happening during this conflict. What, what are the challenges and difficulties to, to using human rights law, putting IHL aside? Open floor. Can't be the first time you've thought of this. Please. I am actually one of those scholars who believe that um, international human rights law should extend. Um, but I think part of the problems is that there are specific protections provided under IHL that may not be provided under international human rights law, and I think that's the problem. So that there are some, there are some protections that may be missing that we need IHL for. That's correct. The primary purpose of IHL is to try to balance those things between trying to minimize the suffering and the killing that happens in war, but at the same time recognizing that war is a reality and therefore permitting under the law to target and to kill and to take life, which is something at its core essence that human rights law does not do. Okay, so, so uh, there's a question here of substantive compatibility with, with the needs of, uh, of, of the state. What about, and this came up earlier, what about the geographical scope of human rights law? Uh, is, is, is there a concern there or not? Uh, if, we, you know, if we're saying, let's use human rights law during armed conflict. Does anyone think that there's a problem with, with that? Anyone on, on that specific issue? Sure. Okay. Um. Uh, the, I think the major concern there, especially for uh, extraterritorial, extraterritorial application, is practicability. Um, whether, whether the state would even have the ability to ensure human rights, um, um, you know, in territories that either they're uh, effectively in control of or where, where they have some kind of influence. Um, I think that's a, a primary concern. Anything else on the territorial side of things? If we speak of uh, international armed conflict, how much uh, responsibility or um, uh, responsibilities would a state carry on on the territory of another state in terms of ensuring human rights? Would it acquire also obligations of the state on whose territory it's carrying on fighting, or will it bear on the own responsibilities? Uh, which, uh, how, how um, big is the scope of, of correlation of responsibilities of both states? of their international responsibilities. So um, different um, agents of states would um, uh, attribute different amount of, of, of rights they can ensure. Thank you. Uh, so why don't I come back now to Alex to summarize some of, some of these issues before we move on to additional questions. Sure, yes. Um, some uh, very salient issues um, have um, already been touched upon. Um, I um, heard the comment saying that um, IHL provides sometimes for specific protections that would not exist um, or at least not um, in this manner um, under a human rights law. 
Um, for instance, um, yes, um, I take um, the case, you know, out of my, my own files, um, particularly, you know, who is, for instance, um, entitled to be specifically protected as, as medical personnel, you know, under IHL. That would be a specific protection that um, exists um, under IHL where you would not necessarily find um, the same sort of um, functional um, protection um, under, under human rights. The same goes, for instance, for, um, take the example of international armed conflicts, where there are certain, obviously certain categories um, of persons um, particularly recognized. You know, you have uh, the fundamental distinction between who is a combatant, um, who is a civilian. So these kinds of questions are, are definitely, um, on the face of it, alien um, to a um, human rights um, framework. Um, in terms of um, right to life, here I would um, defer to um, our um, um, subsequent um, discussion because we're going to um, really delve into uh, a bit more into the interplay between notably conduct of hostilities versus um, law enforcement. Um, indeed, um, these are, on the face of it, um, fundamentally different paradigms, especially you know, when you go into um, an operation, with which mindset um, you go into that um, operation. Um, um, then, um, finally, um, the point on extraterritorial applicability um, has been raised. Um, this, of course, is an issue that um, has occupied um, human rights um, courts and tribunals um, over the last um, couple of years with respect, notably, um, to um, military operations, um, both non-international armed conflicts but also um, international armed conflicts. Um, and, and this, um, the precise boundaries really of um, that, uh, the extent of extraterritorial applicability um, is really still a, a work in progress. Um, what one can say quite bluntly without going too much into details, indeed, where there is effective control over a certain territory, such as in situations of occupation, um, there um, will be um, a recognition, um, usually, of human rights being applicable. Um, and also, um, um, as a second sort of limb, um, if you have um, control over persons, such as typically in, in situations of detention. But sort of the interplay even between those two um, has been um, quite... Um, quite uh, controversial and, 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 and subject to evolving jurisprudence um, within the context of the European Court of Human Rights um, and others. Um, there was one point I was particularly missing um, now in the debate, but that is nonetheless vital. What happens, uh, yes, in terms of states, um, there might be an, an issue there between IHL and human rights clearly, but what about, um, especially in non-international armed conflicts, with regard to the other side, notably um, non-state armed groups. And the question whether um, non-state armed groups um, could um, have any um, human rights obligations. This is an issue that is um, also um, uh, very controversial. Um, there is a tendency to recognize de facto responsibilities of certain non-state armed groups but um, those um, circumstances might be limited. Um, there is a tendency to recognize where they have stable control over territory and also possess some semblance of institutions that would make them de facto resemble um, a government. Uh, and, and this speaks also to the issue of being capable of potentially being able to um, take on um, the, the responsibilities that would arise under human rights, which is uh, sometimes, which are sometimes elaborate um, responsibilities. So we're not only talking about, of course, um, negative obligations, obligations of respect, but also especially the positive obligations. For instance, um, to provide um, judicial processes, etc. So that requires a lot of um, machinery. Um, to be able to respond to those demands. So, so that's um, a, a specific problem I, I also wanted to point the attention towards. <laughs>
add anything on this? No? Okay, just before we move to the next question, uh, just then to, uh, I just want to highlight one of the issues uh, and just to uh, leave you with a bit more food for thought on the extraterritorial applicability uh, side of things in that uh, the, the challenge of course is, is do we, how, how do we even reach the situation where we say human rights applies extraterritorially? Are there individuals, the victims within the jurisdiction of the state? There are notions of bringing someone within the jurisdiction by the actions that you've taken. And as Alexander pointed out, occupying territory seems to be fairly clear because you have responsibility over the whole area. And the other sometimes is when we talk about control over persons and often people, the example that's used is detention. The, and, and again, here you have more and more agreement. Uh, detention, fine, we can use human rights law. You're, you're running a detention facility outside your territory. Why shouldn't you have human rights obligations? But just to, just to kind of leave you with, with a thought here, the, the challenge is, is um, how far do we stretch this? Okay. So uh, the logic easily applies with occupied territory. I think the logic for using human rights law in a detention facility, again, remember that these things can all happen outside of an armed conflict. We haven't got to the interplay between human rights and IHL. You can have situations where states operate, including detaining individuals in another state, not in the context of an armed conflict. Okay. Uh, so, so we're just talking about the question of human rights applying extraterritorially. Now, what if that is not a big, huge detention facility, but people being held, detained in secret? You know, there are cases that came before the Human Rights Committee in the context of uh, um, South America and, and trade union issues, all right? So someone abducted and held in, in, in a secret apartment, uh, and, and this is all done extraterritorially. You, uh, so, so here, shouldn't we also be saying if you, you know, you've got someone, you've detained them, should a human rights law apply? Uh, and, and why shouldn't it just because you're doing it across, uh, across the border? So you, you accept that. Then what if it's not a holding someone for a long time in a detention facility, but state agents are holding someone for, for, for one hour? But, but state agents have crossed the border into somewhere else and they're holding onto someone physically and, and the person's in their power. Should human rights law not apply? What's the difference between the earlier example? Now they're not holding the person for an hour, but they just grab the person for one second, but they put a bullet uh, through that person's head. Okay. Did the right to life not apply? Uh, you know, they had they had that person. They put a bullet through their head, uh, and then and, and then let's say, oh, now they fired the bullet, but they fired the bullet from five meters away. Should it make a difference that they fired that they that they held the person and put the bullet to their head, or that they did it? Isn't it still not a case of the right to life? And then you sniper rifle, 500 meters away, and then drone strike from on top. So you, you see you see where I'm going with this. So, so this is the challenge with extraterritorial applicability. Uh, I, I think logic would dictate going all the way. Uh, because I don't see where you would stop, but uh, this is this is this is where the debate occurs. That some people think, oh, you 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 end up going too far, uh, and and this is where we have this debate. So that's just uh, just a little um, extra point there on uh, extraterritorial applicability. cases, humanitarian law and human rights lead exactly to the same result. When it comes to torture, when it comes to rape, when it comes to deliberate killing of people in the power of the enemy, absolutely no difference. And simply one or the other branch provides more details on substance or provides additional um, implementation mechanisms. Now comes the question, what is a contradiction? And personally, I think that's an important issue. Uh, is, it only, is there only a contradiction if IHL prescribes something and human rights prohibits it? That was the approach in the Al Jeddah case, where they said there is no contradiction because IHL allows internment and human rights prohibits internment in this context. If this was true, I know only one single contradiction between IHL and human rights law, but perhaps you have some other ideas. There's only one example. The law of occupation prescribes military courts in occupied territories, and human rights law, at least as interpreted in Europe and the Americas, the Americas is only south of the Rio Grande because Canada and uh, the US are not a party to the American uh, Convention. Uh, it is prohibited to bring civilians before a military court. But that's the only example I know. So, but if we are realistic, we have to admit that even if IHL permits something and I, human rights law prohibits this, there is a contradiction. I mean, under IHL it is lawful to kill enemy combatants, 
under human rights law, you would have to try first to arrest them. And there, I think, we have to solve the tension. Uh, all this is also related to an important issue whether IHL authorizes at all anything. And this is the lotus debate we are between international lawyers, so I don't give more details, which in my view remains a very theoretical debate until we have human rights law because human rights law requires a legal basis for detaining people, for killing people. And here, a lot of people and states try to argue that my legal basis for killing this person or for detaining this person is IHL. And then there can be a contradiction. Leg specialis. Well, the problem is, I think the term, sorry, is because he doesn't like and I like it, but for the rest, we mostly agree. So it's a pure terminological thing. And why doesn't he like it? Because it's often abused of and misunderstood. And I say self-defense is also abused of, and a lot of rules of international law are abused of, but it's not a reason to abandon them. But look, um, so, some people say, Lex Specialis means only IHL applies in armed conflict. And this is wrong. I think it's also wrong to say whenever IHL has a rule, it's the rule of IHL which applies. And therefore, I understand those who don't like Lex Specialis because it looks as if um, human rights don't apply wherever there is a problem covered by both because, I mean, freedom of press is not covered by IHL, and therefore most people would agree that it nevertheless uh, applies even in armed conflict. I think the issue is not either which is the more protective rule. This is the rule in human rights law. If you have two rules, you choose the more protective one, but between IHL and human rights law, it would be meaningless because in 98% it's the human rights. I hope in the ICSC it uh, will not fall down when I say uh, human rights law is more protective than humanitarian law, but humanitarian law is more realistic in armed conflict than human rights law. So it is indeed, I, according to me, the more detailed rule, as you say, the rule which provides in respect of certain facts, because I would say it's not even a relation between two rules. It's a relation between two rules in respect of two facts. One or the other has a greater common, that's uh, one of my students who created this term, a greater common surface, contact surface area between the facts and the rule. And therefore, and there, most people disagree with me. In my view, sometimes it's IHL, which is the Lex Specialis, and sometimes it's uh, human rights law, the Lex Specialis. But there is, again, it's mainly a terminological issue because those people would simply call it the Lex Generalis, which prevails sometimes. I would say the two can constitute, in a certain situation, the Lex Specialis. The alternative, and you mentioned the Vienna Convention, and at least one of my students is a total fan of that. Uh, uh, the solution is the Vienna Convention, which, by the way, doesn't mean, doesn't mention Lex Specialis. Huh? Uh, so the idea of systemic integration to interpret one, uh, taking the other into account, often leads, in my view, to the same results. It also raises the question, what is interpretation? And here we will discuss about a case where the European Court on Human Rights simply changes, changes a rule of human rights law in saying, I interpret this rule in light of uh, IHL, and I think this is slightly abusive. Another question is, Lex Specialis is a relationship between two treaty rules. While often, especially in non-international armed conflict, we have customary law, and at least under traditional customary law, you don't determine Lex Specialis between two customary rules. You just try to determine which is the customary rule applicable to my problem. 
out of state practice and opinion juris applicable to that uh, problem. And then comes Lex Specialis by analogy, because you know most of the problems are in non-international armed conflict, and we don't have rules on uh, many issues in the treaties on non-international armed conflict, but states try to apply by analogy the rules of international armed conflict, and this goes for me a little too far to claim the Lex Specialis is something against hard human rights law, which we draw by analogy from another situation, which is international armed conflict, but this is very controversial. And finally, just two points, Lex Specialis through jurisprudence, because often we say human rights law is much more detailed on many issues, but it's not true if you look at the treaties. It is only because there is much more jurisprudence of human rights bodies, but this does mean that the Lex Specialis shifts, and in my view this is not possible, all the time between Every time a human rights court takes a decision, the Lex Specialis moves, and then comes the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, which gives a more detailed interpretation of a rule of IHL, and then the, the Lex Specialis moves again. I'm skeptical about that, and uh, some of you mentioned it. I think it's also a question of the enforcement mechanism. Perhaps it also depends very much which mechanisms uses it. But obviously, if I'm a state, if I'm the a human rights court, theoretically, I don't favor that. They could simply apply human rights and say, we don't care about IHL. But if I'm a state, I'm bound by both. So I have somehow to integrate the two. The suggestion that use Kogens, Erga Omnes, and so on is helpful is certainly with other rules of international law, but you know, in human rights and humanitarian law, where it comes hard to hard, probably both would claim they are ergo omnes and to use cogens, and therefore it's not very uh, useful. And uh, on the derogation issue, the problem is simply practical. In my view, in the ICC, I can say that in a human rights body, I would be expelled states should more often derogate. But the problem is most of the time they don't derogate. And this creates the problem. Because if they derogate, it's exactly what you explained. But most of the time, most of the states con concerned by armed conflicts do not derogate. And therefore, we cannot say, now derogations have to take into account other international obligations, because they didn't derogate. And the European Court on Human Rights in the Hafsan case found a very strange I, and dangerous idea to say subsequent practice shows that you don't have to derogate. And I must say, this is very dangerous because subsequent practice shows a lot of things which could be a violation of the European Convention. Thank you. Thanks, Marco. Uh, I, I feel compelled though, quickly to say something about yes. Lex Specialis. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, here is simply, my, my problem is, is this. First of all, this issue of it meaning all things to all people. Uh, I, I recall sitting at an expert meeting uh, maybe seven years ago or something, and we were discussing this, this precise issue, and there were 20 people around the table, and the question was asked, you know, what's the solution uh, to the interplay? And you go around the table, and everyone said Lex Specialis, Lex Specialis, and then someone wanted to move on. You know, that, that's fine, we're okay. And then I said, hold on. And I, I just asked just a random s a few people, what do you mean, Lex Specialis, Lex Specialis? And every single one of the people that said Lex Specialis meant something completely different, but completely different. You know, one was going to completely displace human rights law, the other meant that Lex Specialis is human rights law, and, you know, and, and, and on and on and on. And to me, when something means all things to all people, it's not a helpful concept. Uh, and, and yes, there are lots of areas where, where, and principles where we have debate, but I think it's served to obfuscate the, the debate here. That, that, you know, we, it, it's too easily, it's the abracadabra. You know, we say it, it's, it's Latin, it sounds smart, and then we think we've got the answer and we don't try and deal with it. And so, so my, my concern is that. The other concern is, is that, uh, and, and actually I think, I think in many ways we agree uh, on this and some of the comments that, that were made, is that it gives us the impression that the answer is a, a top-down principle, that you have one sort of legal theory answer to all of the 
uh, the, the problems that can arise between human rights and IHL, uh, and you just you know you apply this principle from the, from the top, and that's that's fine. And I think the answer is is is, a, is bottom up. It's it's case by case. Uh, and context by context, and the interplay between human rights and IHL will, will operate differently in, in every different scenario. And for that, I would just say watch this space, uh, because uh, pr within a year we're going to be publishing a project that I'm involved in uh, in uh, Chatham House. In England, we're, we're putting together a, a human rights manual for the military. Now, it's, men, main, uh, it, it's meant mainly for the UK military in the context of ECHR, but it, obviously it'll be wider than that, and it's uh, and, and, and it goes chapter by chapter. It says, in detention, this is how human rights and IHL operate together. When you're manning a checkpoint, this is how human rights and IHL operate together. In use of force, this is how... The, and and, and I, I think that's the only way we're ever going to be able to solve this, is if we stop trying to think that there are legal, legal answers, but we just say, in this context, that's what you do. In this context, that's what you do, and we just come up with, uh, with that. But, but uh, again, I don't think we're actually that far from each other in terms of how we solve it. For you, regarding the issue of the competence of the military court, what what might what might be your answer? So, oh, and, and I agree. This 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 is probably, and I, I agree with Marco. <laughs> I've said this as well. This this is the one where we have a uh, a, a clear contradiction. Um, I think some of that will end up being solved possibly it, well, in two ways. Either state practice over time will coalesce around one of these rules, and it may well be human rights law. Uh, with time will prevail. We'll just see that more and more states are accepting that you don't bring civilians before military courts, even if the Fourth Geneva Convention allows it, and, and that might simply be... Describes it. Uh, yeah, and that might simply be uh, that, that, that we, just, we just see uh, practice changing, um, and, and that becomes... The, and, and I think that's probably the likely way out of this. Uh, but uh, I would disagree, uh, because the problem is the, system, the overall systemic purposes of international law have to be taken into account, and an occupying power may only have a military presence and may not constitute civilian courts, otherwise it would be an annexation. And therefore, I think, uh, here the IHL rule prevails because it represents an overall purpose while an occupying power bringing uh, people from the occupied territory before its uh, civilian courts would either deport them, which is prohibited, or annex the occupied territory. So as long as soon as occupation no longer exists, I agree with you. But as long as this old-fashioned phenomenon exists, uh, we have to deal with this specific. Yeah. Well, well, the other, the, the, yeah. the remainder of what I was going to say was that I think there may, there, we may also see within practice uh, very limited exceptions uh, being being uh, formulated in practice, exceptions to human rights law, and that human rights bodies may accept uh, that that there will be very limited <coughs> situations in which you do, uh, and, and then the focus will be on the independence and are these courts within a certain chain of command and, and so on. So I, th I think it will be solved through state practice, which will, I think, generally fall towards human rights law with very limited exceptions in very specific contexts. But, but, but we, we, we don't okay, know. Yeah, yeah, we can wait and see. It's not, uh, all we're doing here is we're guessing how is this going to be solved in the future. So, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not right. Marco's not right. You're not right. Nobody's right because we're predicting the future. To kick off um, this uh, particular um, issue um, in, a, in, a, in a practical manner and to um, set you in a scenario, unfortunately it should have, um, we, there, there would have been um, on this slide a, a little case study, but um, uh, um, some, some technical things went wrong. So I'm just going to give you um, a, a set of facts. Um, and, and, and just before I do that, um, a, a bit of background. Um, the ICRC has um, actually led um, an expert process um, on um, is the interplay um, with regards to the use of force um, against persons um, um, as regards um, the paradigms of conduct of hostilities um, may, uh, governed by um, IHL and um, law enforcement. So mainly um, deriving from um, human rights. And uh, because um, we realized, especially in um, situations of non-international armed conflicts, you might face certain situations where it is not so easy, really, um, to decide um, which of these um, paradigms should apply um, to a, um, a set of facts. Um, and this can be... Um, because this set, uh, there, there, are, there are mixed situations, 
um, um, that's one example. And, and one um, case, a um, uh, short case I wanted to give you is, um, imagine um, you are in the context of a non-international armed conflict, and you have a demonstration um, that occurs um, against um, the government's, say, repression of the insurgency. Um, and um, in the course of that demonstration, um, hundreds of people um, gather in, in the main um, uh, street of the capital, um, where also governmental armed forces um, are engaged, and are engaged also um, generally in hostilities um, against um, fighters. Um, and um, in the course of you know, trying to manage this demonstration, the demonstration turns violent, so um, the demonstrators start throwing rocks, but um, there are fighters, actually, that take advantage of the situation and mix in between um, the uh, violent demonstrators. So my question to you is, in this kind of set of facts, what um, paradigm um, under the use of force would you apply? Um, would it be conduct of hostilities? Would it be law enforcement? Would it be both? The IHL one, because the, there are combatants and they're using force. If we reach a, th a certain threshold, let's say, um, and IHL rules would allow to distinguish between the demonstrators who are civilians or, or non-combatants and then the combatants. So that would give us what we need for proportionality and assessment of uh, the action and their legality. Although I remember from the previous session, the, then, then we're talking about IHL proportionality, where we're only concerned with collateral damage, uh, and some collateral damage, and it means that some harm to civilians who are not involved is legitimate, yes, um, exactly. as opposed to human rights proportionality, which would take into account even the effect on, on the exactly. fighters. So we need to remember when we're saying, if you're saying the IHL one, then we're using IHL proportionality, which, uh, which clearly allows for, yes. for collateral damage amongst the uninvolved. And it, will, it, okay. and it would still, uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, but less at a, at a low. Absolutely, and it would still not uh, make the civilians a legitimate target in any oh. way. Perhaps using human rights law uh, there instead of IHL, because uh, you said under these limited facts that you've given us that we're trying to make recommendations on ROE. Most typical ROE will require before taking force against a combatant to positively identify them as a combatant in the facts that you've described, it's a commingled crowd, and therefore the presumption must be that they are all civilians unless you can do the positive identification to use military force. So I would begin with the assessment, these are all civilians that may require a later status determination to apply uh, different rules, but as far as the initial use of force in a commingled crowd under the circumstances you described, I, I think uh, I would be recommending uh, human rights. The way I understood there was NIAC, um, I would agree and maybe build upon Etienne that it's law enforcement paradigm for me, but at the same time, if we're talking about continuous combat function, is the question how you're going to approach from the state perspective if you are um, suggesting to the state officials how they have to behave. I would agree human rights law because continued combat function will be very dangerous in that context, but then there is another question which comes to what you have mentioned. Now, in that context, they armed forces will be allowed to use, for example, the weapons which under IHL is prohibited. And um, the state will think, wait a minute, then I'm going to have a problem from the IHL. But in overall, if I was arguing and suggesting for the state how to behave in, in the demonstration, I would say law enforcement paradigm because of proportionality criteria in IHL with the um, civilians present on the ground. That's a really interesting point. I'm assuming Alexander will pick up on the weapons because it may be that law enforcement actually allows better weapons than, 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 than IHL yeah. in this. So, um, Alex, you want to...? No, very, very interesting. Um, well, um, I could see that a majority of, of the room were leaning um, towards um, um, applying a law enforcement um, model. So, uh, of course, um, then uh, the, the first question that has to be asked, yes, but there are are obviously fighters um, within the crowd. Does um, the law enforcement model um, really allow us to respond effectively even to the fighters um, within the crowd? And um, the answer would be of yes. Um, so if they, uh, of course, um, represent an immediate threat um, to life, um, yes, um, uh, the, the use of force um, can be 
um, directed um, against them. Um, just to um, also um, pick up um, on perhaps so, um, uh, taking it um, backwards um, from that last point because it was uh, a particularly interesting point in terms of the weapons. Um, here you see an example actually where um, IHL is even more protective in that sense than human rights law. Because obviously if you apply a law enforcement model to the entire situation, um, you would allow, um, though, uh, if, if it's armed forces that um, actually conduct the operation, you would allow them to use riot control agents or also, um, you know, um, 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 hollow bullets, for example. Um, things that would be prohibited under IHL. So, use of riot control agents under IHL as a method of warfare, as you know, is um, what, uh, at least, what, what we, what is um, quite um, uh, consensually regarded as uh, prohibited. Um, because it would lead, of course, the, the, the potential of an escalation in response um, with um, even more powerful um, chemical weapons. So for that reason, there is um, this um, specific um, prohibition. Um, so um, in terms of um, um, the, um, uh, applying the um, uh, conduct of hostilities um, model, um, here, of course, yes, um, uh, the fighters are lawful targets. But then um, you might uh, face an issue here, um, especially if the crowd is numerous around them, in terms of proportionality and precautions. So effectively, um, if you don't have very precise sniper capabilities, um, the upshot would be that actually you'd have to uh, refrain even from um, targeting um, the um, fighters um, in, in that um, situation. Um, there was another very um, interesting point made in terms of um, um, leaning towards the um, human rights um, paradigm um, because um, uh, most rules of engagement would already require to positively identify um, um, if someone is a lawful target um, or not. In fact, one interesting um, result of this um, expert um, process was to recognize that in these uh, difficult situations, especially under the IHL precautionary, even under the IHL precautionary obligation to positively verify that you know, the person in front of you is a lawful target, that this would imply um, a kind of um, escalation of force procedure that would be um, very common um, in, under, under human rights law. And just also um, a remark on the rules of engagement. Um, no matter what for legal um, reasons, what uh, kind of mindset you would go into the operations, rule of, uh, rules of engagement are usually not only informed by law, but also for policy reasons. Um, and um, in many respects, these would be quite um, stringent. So, um, in essence, um, um, then even if legally you would um, adhere to a more permissible um, standard for, for policy reasons, you might um, resort um, even to um, stricter standards um, as, as laid down in, in the rules um, of engagement. What surprised me though was that no one actually suggested to apply those two in parallel, meaning um, against the fighter's conduct of hostilities versus um, against um, the demonstrators, um, the rest of the crowd, um, human rights. In fact, this was the result um, of um, the debates um, in this context because it was um, simply said that it legally, of course, it, it, it is the solution that would make most sense to recognize that there are actually two different situations, although these two different situations happen to be very close to each other. However, still, of course, as a practical matter, very difficult to implement. That's why, you know, in, 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 uh, at least in the ICSC conclusions, um, um, you might have a fundamental difficulty, of course, if you um, go for IHL against the fighters, precisely to distinguish who is who. 
Is it a fighter having a continuous combat function? Is a civilian directly participating in hostilities? Is it merely a civilian um, throwing rocks participating in a demonstration, but that otherwise, but for that spontaneous manifestation of their anger, does nothing, ha have nothing to do with the collective resort um, to hostilities that would give you the kind of belligerent nexus to regard that person as directly participating in hostilities. So that's very difficult. And in cases where it is uh, difficult, there is uh, the possibility to uh, effectively to fall back um, on the law enforcement um, paradigm. So I think... Um, I'll, I'll stop it. I, I just want to clarify quickly something on proportionality that was said, uh, just uh, so I don't leave you with, with, with a misconception, uh, and then I'll, I'll turn to, to Marco. Uh, the proportionality, uh, and I was saying earlier that proportionality is, is different between the two. Uh, under human rights law as well, uh, proportionality, you could still end up with, with harm to, to others and still say that it's proportionate. Uh, the reason that the human rights law proportionality test is uh, more stringent is because it requires you to take into account the harm uh, the, the, to, to the person that you're targeting. Whereas the IHL proportionality, as we'd, we'd said earlier, the person that you're targeting, if they, if they don't have civilian protection, you don't even need to count them in the proportionality. You only need to count the harm to the others. And in the human rights law, you'd need to count the harm to the person you're, t you're targeting and the harm to the others. Uh, and, and then still, depending, you know, you could reach all sorts of solutions. But that's also linked to, to the question of weapons. And, and I think it's interesting whether, whether indeed to say that certain weapons are banned is, is more protective uh, is, is that necessarily the case? Uh, because, for example, looking specifically at this issue of, of proportionality, if under uh, uh, IHL you're not allowed to use hollow point bullets, dum dum bullets, right? And 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 the only weapons that you have uh, are regular bullets, then uh, you will more likely be harming not just the person you're targeting, but the bullet will go through them and 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 possibly kill or injure another three, four people. If you're using dum dum bullets. You can target the one person, it hits them, and that's what dum dum bullets, hollow point bullets do. They, they, they go in and, and, and they don't come out the other side. It causes horrible damage in, in, inside, but it's safer for the other people around. So in theory, you could argue that, uh, that allowing certain weapons is more protective, and it's interesting because you have this in human rights law, and there have been some cases, such as the Gulich case in the European Court of Human Rights, where one of the things they're saying to the state, you go out to deal with demonstrations like this, you need to have the right kind of equipment, the right kind of riot control to minimize uh, to minimize harm, and if you go out uh, with, without it, then, then you're violating human rights. So you could even argue under human rights law, you're required to use certain um, certain methods that you might not want to be using under under IHL, which is complicated. I'll turn over to Mark if you want to comment on this, and then straight away move into detention. It's just one sentence. When I am asked what is the greatest difference between human rights law and IHL, it's the distinction between civilians and combatants doesn't exist in human rights law, and that's in my view, for the use of force, the big issue, that everyone is simply a human being and therefore you have to individualize uh, the use of force while in IHL, according to its letter in international armed conflict and now increasingly for all kind of uh, constructions in non-international armed conflict, you create categories of people which in the reality of fighting in a battle is probably inevitable because you cannot individualize as much as the police can in uh, a law enforcement uh, situation. I come now to deprivation of liberty and there I would also uh, try to give you just uh, two scenarios which come from two cases, uh, both on the European Convention but do not happen in Europe, that's an interesting thing. Uh, first, in an international armed conflict, and I think it's important in which situations this happens. In international armed conflict, in uh, occupation of Iraq, the United Kingdom arrested Mr. Hassan for 10 days, he was not brought before a judge, and uh, he was believed to be an insurgent, but finally, after 10 days, he was released. And the European Court on Human Rights, uh, under its normal practice, 10 days, you cannot detain someone 10 days without 
a legal basis and a judicial procedure, even if it is for imperative security reasons and so on. But the court said we have to accommodate this is what the systemic integration interpretation people like. Uh, we have to accommodate, uh, as far as possible, the interpretation of human rights law to the applicable humanitarian law. And as under humanitarian law, uh, internment for imperative security reasons is admissible, and as the administrative checking of the legality of the detention was given. The court considered that it was lawful. I think the result is correct, but to claim that this is an interpretation would be totally correct under the UN Covenant and under the Inter-American Convention. Under the European Convention it's not possible because there is a closed list of admissible reasons of detention and you cannot say, I interpret this article by putting a new reason in. And therefore, this is why, sorry, I think we have to work with the Lex Specialist thing. You cannot simply say it's interpreting the European Convention because interpret is not adding something which is not in the text, but using the text. But for the UN Covenant and for the Inter-American Convention, this could certainly work. So the court said this is lawful and uh, Humanitarian law provides the legal basis which is necessary under human rights law. The second case is the Serra Mohammed case, which happened in a non-international armed conflict in Afghanistan. And Serra Mohammed was also uh, seen as an insurgent and detained by the British with all kinds of checks, but no judicial control, and the United Kingdom had no legal basis in UK law or in Afghan law, because under Afghan law, uh, United Kingdom cannot detain people in Afghanistan. And two instances of UK courts, now it has been decided by the appeal court, it will come before the Supreme Court, decided that this is a violation of the European Convention because the uh, the law of non-international armed conflict doesn't give a legal basis. And habeas corpus prevails because there is no procedure under the law of non-international armed conflict. So the question is, are now on deprivation of liberty, detention, what are the differences in which situations concerning legal basis, admissible reasons, necessary procedures to check legality, of what kind of persons in international armed conflict and non-international armed conflict and how to reconcile these uh, two. On the Muhammad case, my understanding of the Muhammad case was that the court found that there was no legal basis because there wasn't a specific authorization to detain um, in the in common article 3 or the additional protocol. Um, which I found problematic just because, uh, I mean certainly there's state practice um, you know, I mean, the reason why it refers to uh, detention procedures and and you know other incidents of detention in the additional protocols because I think it assumes um, that that states will detain, uh, and the alternative seems far scarier. If you if if detention is not a possibility, um, you know, it begs the question of what well, then what is uh, what is possible? Is it is it only lethal action, or does it assume that only law enforcement action would be possible when you capture someone rather than rather than kill Can them. I ask why you say it's not a possibility if, if I mean if the court was saying it is a possibility you, ju you, you just need to legislate for it right but but I think the, that probably the state I think the state took the position that well by acceding to this treaty we you know the assumption behind the treaty was that detention was authorized because states had been doing it state, it, it provided for detention procedures um, so states were authorized to do it without a specific positive, um, you know, positive provision for it. Yeah, well, I'm sure Mark is going to have a lot to say about that in a couple of minutes. Uh, can, I, can I ask you, when you're thinking about all of these issues, uh, to consider also armed groups, particularly if we're talking about non-international armed conflict and, and these questions and what are the implications of what you're saying 
uh, for non-international armed conflicts in that context. Um, any more comments on uh, the legal basis uh, or the reasons for detention? And a limit, I guess, to the ECHR because this took logically Mohammed will end up in ECHR. And I think from the procedural perspective, how the court will look in interpreting under Article 5. And I think it will have a different conclusion than Hassan case because um, basically we are using habeas corpus as a human rights procedure to actually interpret IHL. It's fascinating, as Professor Sassoli would like to say. But um, at the end of the day, I think due very specifically that the legal basis is not present in NIAC in Common Article 3 and Additional Protocol 2, we will find... Uh, Hypothetically, I think the court will find a violation. And that's very interesting from the perspective that this will be a judgment from a court looking at detention and legal basis in IAC and NIAC, and we will have two cases. But I think um, what's also to, to pick in mind is that we are using actually the human rights procedure to look at it. Yes, and, and it's worth pointing out that in the, the Hassan case, they, they kind of signaled already that this is what's going to happen when they made the comment about derogation um, and said, in an international armed conflict. And so it, they, they seem to be saying that they would do something different in a non-international armed conflict. I mean, we'll, we'll wait and see, but, but it looks like they, they are point, they left it open to, to reach, as you say, a, a potentially a different decision a different approach in, in Nayak. Gus, you? Yeah, I mean, I just want to uh, sort of cover ground that you've actually mentioned already to this point, but um, the issue at the end of the day really is not, because I think some people read into it that it that it must, that there must be an authorization, but if it doesn't regulate or provide for authorization for detention during Nayak, the fact remains that that authorization comes from else, can come from elsewhere, and that's the factual question. So um, if there is municipal legislation, for example, that provides for that, detention, then there is a legal basis for detention. But the point is that IHL in itself, certainly from a NIAC perspective, does not provide that legal authorization. And I think it's a, it's a very subtle thing, but people miss it, I think, in the debate. And I do think in Hassan, I mean, the, the language the court employed was very problematic in, in that uh, dynamic between IHL and, and, and IHRL in that context. So. Thanks. Uh, Marco? Just on the customary law argument, it would be a good argument on probably the European Court on Human Rights would accept custom law as a basis, but there is not sufficient practice and opinion juris. Most states confronted to non-international armed conflict have domestic legislation, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and so on. They have domestic legislation allowing uh, detention. And second, uh, as you could say yes, but in extraterritorial non-international armed conflict, there is state practice. Most states in Afghanistan did not detain more than 96 hours. And therefore, most states apparently thought that as they don't have a legal basis, they cannot detain people. And those who detained, again, I fully agree, they could create a legal basis either through domestic law or international law. They could have a treaty with Afghanistan which allows them to detain. No problem. I think that in international armed conflict for prisoners of war, all the three points are clear in IHL and therefore satisfy the human rights uh, requirements. For civilians who are prosecuted anyway, the rules on IHL and humanitarian law are the same. For internment, you can have a doubt whether Article 78 of Convention Number 4 is actually a legal basis to intern or whether you have an occupying power has in addition to legislate. Um, and imperative security reasons are the admissible reasons and um, there must be an administrative procedure and an administrative appeal which doesn't satisfy the law uh, human rights law, but uh, the Inter-American Commission in the hard court case has accepted this. I think the real test is in non-international armed conflict. And there, the simple fact that internment, wounding, uh, destruction of nature is mentioned in a treaty does not authorize to do this. Sorry, I don't understand this argument to say uh, internment is mentioned and therefore it's authorized because you need an authorization. It's simply regulated, which doesn't mean uh, authorized. And simply, I don't think a human rights body 
will ever accept that a hard law rule of human rights like habeas corpus will be uh, derogated from or accommodated uh, to or be displaced by a lex specialis which is not hard law but which is either drawn by analogy and sorry, I mean, imagine a Geneva policeman arrests you and you ask, what is your basis? And he says, you know, I arrest you by analogy with another legislation. I don't think you accept that and I don't think any human rights judge will accept it. While it would be good if we had specific rules on that, but states don't want them because the ICSC suggests rules on detention, and the ICSC suggested to have a treaty on this, if I understand correctly, and states absolutely don't want it. Okay, if you don't want it, what you get is human rights law. Sorry for that. You could have it because that would be accepted if there was a specific treaty which was giving these uh, guarantees. Just perhaps one, um, two sentences on, on, on ICSC since um, that has been uh, touched upon. Um, effectively, we are um, among those that um, actually consider, especially in a non-international armed conflict, that indeed there is an implied power to conduct internment. Um, but um, in essence, we also say, and, and this is very important to package always, um, that um, IHL, as it stands, um, it, it does not, the issue does not stop there. So, so you need then to have grounds and procedures. And precisely that is lacking. I think um, no, nobody um, doubts that. Um, so in essence, this is the reason why um, we are currently um, leading a process on strengthening legal protection for persons deprived uh, for um, for um, victims of armed conflicts, and one of um, the components of this process is especially on detention in non-international armed conflicts, and this is um, one of the areas that is being addressed. Indeed, um, we would have considered it uh, desirable if there had been an appetite um, at this stage for a new treaty. Um, politically, that does not seem to be the case. So what we are um, proposing, um, and, and this is um, the, the next international conference um, of the Red Cross and Red Crescent next December will be a, a decisive um, stepping stone in this regard, whether um, the ICRC will be given a mandate to lead a further process that will eventually might lead to um, an outcome document or documents um, of a non-legally binding nature, but nonetheless of a, of a normative character. So um, I just uh, wanted to um, flag that. And with, in, in relation to international armed conflicts, here we are, um, we are of the view that there is no need for, for further domestic legislation. So um, IHL on international armed conflicts is um, already sufficiently precise in terms of grounds and procedures for POWs and civilian internees. So I just wanted to, to complement. Um, also, Article 78 explicitly said that the occupying power must legislate for the procedures. But okay. And of, and of course, what we didn't touch was, was uh, armed groups, and, yeah. and you can take that away with you to, to think about in terms mm -hmm. of uh, w how, how would this solve the issue with regard to uh, the grounds for, for detention and basis for detention by armed groups. The International Court of Justice uh, dealt with extraterritorial, accepts extraterritorial application of human rights law in the whole case, Uganda case. It speaks about Lex Specialis in the nuclear weapons and the world case, but it does not really apply Lex Specialis. It has a cumulative approach. It cumulates the two, but it has not yet led to absurd results. The European Court of Human Rights has had a lot of problems with the extraterritorial application. It moved from Bankovic, no extraterritorial application, to today, territorial control and personal control. Um, as for IHL, traditionally in the cases concerning Turkey and Chechnya, it simply ignored IHL, but used at least in English, not in French, they didn't understand the translator, they copy-pasted wording from Protocol Additional 1 on precautionary measures. Um, but now, 
uh, with Hassan, I think we have a tendency where they actually take into account and uh, accommodate. Now we have future cases, Georgia versus Russia, Ukraine versus Russia, where the European court will have to deal a lot with IHL. I think the toughest point on the right to life remains the absolute obligation of inquiry they see, which does not exist in IHL and is very difficult in hostilities to imagine. The inter-American system is very open, extraterritorial, much larger. It applies human rights in non-international armed conflicts. Um, the Commission was going further, the court was slowing down in the Las Palmeras, Bamaka, Velasquez case. Uh, it uses the term Lex Specialis. Uh, it uses IHL to interpret and reinforce uh, human rights law, in particular on disappearances, on destructions, on pillage, on women, rights of women and children. A very interesting thing is now on reparation, and a lot of people don't know that, that the Inter-American Court has decided, following some massacres, that states have to make dissemination of humanitarian law and of human rights law, and they have to adopt national legislation of implementation of both humanitarian law and human rights law as a reparation, and all public officials must know the Inter-American Convention as interpreted by the court, and the court introduces humanitarian law. This is an interesting aspect of prevention. And finally, the African Commission and Court, the convention applies uh, the, inter, uh, the African uh, Convention on Human and People's Rights applies in uh, non-international armed conflicts. The only case where it dealt really with IHL was in Democratic Republic of Congo versus Burundi, Rwanda and uh, Uganda. There it said that the Commission is entitled to take IHL into account, that the Geneva Conventions and additional protocols are general principles of law recognized by African states. It referred very liberally, and not always totally accurately in my view, but to IHL, but only always in link with the provision of the African Charter. And in its reports and examining reports, uh, it does interestingly not mention, even where there's an armed conflict, uh, international humanitarian law. Please. Okay, with that, um, uh, very quickly on uh, UN Human Rights Committee um, working group on arbitrary detention that uh, recently um, published um, documents that, that are relevant to the issues we, that we are discussing. Uh, UN Human Rights Committee um, general comment number 35 on Article 9 of the, the ICCPR, um, Liberty and Security um, of the Person. And there, um, it's interesting to note that um, it recognized that security detention, namely internment, that is authorized and regulated by and complying with IHL, in principle is not arbitrary. So, um, in essence, this um, goes for um, IHL um, internment provisions in international armed conflict, because only there you have both authorization, regulation, etc. So, um, in essence, it leaves out um, non-international armed conflicts. Um, and then it also um, it deals with um, the issues of uh, limits of derogation. Here again, in terms of international armed conflicts, it says that um, the substantive and procedural rules of IHL remain applicable and limit the ability to derogate so such that this is sort of the minimum kind of standard that you would uh, still have to comply even when um, derogating. Here again, a distinction to um, non-international um, armed conflicts. With regard to the working group on arbitrary detention, um, here um, there are certain principles that are um, specified um, even um, in, for international armed conflicts. 
um, such as um, you know um, appeal or periodic review of decisions to in turn um, applying in an IAC that um, these must comply with um, principles including um, habeas corpus. So um, it is not entirely clear um, if uh, they had in mind really to um, draft you know, additional um, recommendations because on the face of it, um, of course, um, there is a, a, a challenge already with um, um, some of the rules that are contained in, in um, the third and, and the fourth um, Geneva Conventions. Um, in in non-international armed conflict, so in essence, um, administrative detention or internment only possible um, if um, there is a public emergency and um, the extent, uh, and and um, complying with um, the um, the uh, requirements in in terms of um, derogation. So there is a need to derogate if uh, in, for in in, in non-international armed conflicts if you want to to resort to this um, possibility. Um, I just quickly wanted to also um, uh, say a few words on um, two special rapporteurs that um, recently have conducted um, some work um, interesting um, for some of the issues, um, namely um, uh, the special rapporteur on um, the right to life, so summary and uh, arbitrary um, executions, Chris Haynes, um, who took a specific interest um, both on the use of force in general, obviously, um, including for law enforcement, but also in the context of um, lethal autonomous weapons and, and armed drones. In this context, I mean, there was a quite a realistic um, recognition um, by, by Haynes that um, although human rights continues to apply, um, um, he recognized that conditions under human rights might be relaxed in the light of IHL also applying. So um, that was quite interesting to um, note. And also with regard, because it has been touched upon, um, uh, issues in relation to investigations after the fact. This is one point I, I forgot perhaps to mention, that this um, is still an issue um, where it really matters if you have a, for instance, a law enforcement operation or a, um, an operation under the paradigm of conduct of hostilities because simply um, the thresholds, um, and especially when an obligation to investigate is triggered, as well as um, f in which circumstances um, are um, um, simply different um, under human rights and, and, and IHL, so human rights much more um, stringent, of course. Um, and here, um, he um, also um, recognized that um, in, in armed conflict situations, the stringent requirements under human rights might be um, considered to be attenuated. Um, that, in, 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 in distinction to uh, the Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism, where um, the Special Rapporteur, um, in terms of investigations, applied quite um, a, a strict standard that um, there is an obligation to investigate under both bodies of law um, every time there are unintended or unanticipated um, civilian casualties. So that would then trigger um, an obliga obligations to um, investigate um, and um, of two components. So first conduct fact finding and then if there is a reasonable suspicion um, of uh, violations, then um, criminal um, investigations. So a lot of these challenges are being played out right now in, uh, in cases before international bodies uh, and they, they relate also to particular issues within human rights law itself such as extraterritorial applicability that we I think are moving slowly uh, towards some, some kind of uh, common understanding that not everyone would necessarily agree with but, but uh, I think a more comprehensive understanding of how and when human rights law applies extraterritorially and uh, that is uh, going to help us very much uh, in uh, in the future, uh, but uh, also with regard to the interplay between the two of them, we're seeing cases come up now, for example, in the European Court of Human Rights, recently the Hassan case and soon the uh, Russia-Georgia case, uh, which uh, again might uh, start pointing in certain directions of the, of the interplay between the two and how international bodies are going to do this. My, my guess, but uh, my guess perhaps is informed uh, or perhaps... Uh, uh, in, in certain ways, uh, this, is, this is my hope rather than my guess, but, but let's, let's assume that they're the same. 
uh, is that we are starting to, I hope, move away from assuming that we have clear uh, legal principles that can be applied top down and that there's sort of some magical sh solution to the interplay between human rights and IHL. And with more and more cases and more practice, we're going to see how uh, we, we try and solve this by looking in particular situations, particular contexts, uh, so that uh, the solution isn't uh, one, one solution for all situations, but rather uh, the interplay between human rights and IHL will work in a certain way in detention. It'll work in another way in occupation, and it'll work in another way with regard to use of force in a demonstration, uh, and so on. So, so we're going to have to solve this in a case-by-case in -case scenario, but we're working towards that. And I think once we have that and we have more established practice, uh, hopefully this, this question will become less of a, a troubling one in the future. Where, where really um, um, there is also uh, and, and will remain a key difference, even if, um, and, and um, here I'm, I'm a bit paraphrasing from um, other scenarios that have been examined over this expert process, even if during an operation um, through interpretation um, and others, um, the, the two paradigms might um, come to similar results um, where um, there is still um, a fundamental difference is already in terms of planning, in terms of the kind of equipment and training those conducting um, each type of operations would have. Um, and therefore, it will be, it become more, more and more important that um, um, armed forces, for instance, um, are trained also in law enforcement um, ways of, of dealing um, with a, a situation and also um, police forces might be um, confronted with situations that um, might uh, fall under the conduct of hostilities paradigm. So in essence, you know, uh, on an international level, international law does not take a position who should um, conduct which operations and in the reality of um, today's situation, um, this issue becomes ever more important to be able to switch um, between different paradigms, um, which is not um, always easy in, in the heat of the moment. Another um, fundamental difference is, and this was also addressed today, is, is after the fact in terms of um, obligations um, to investigate um, deaths that might occur as a result of um, such operations. So um, here, um, human rights and, 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 and IHL um, still um, seem to be um, different um, and uh, with regard to human rights for instance it is uh, common that uh, the, the standards are much more stringent than um, under human rights but um, this um, question of um, investigating um, cases of suspicious death or um, um, in, as a result of, of operations this um, is, 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 is something that um, where, where there would need you know even more um, more examination in terms of um, the interplay um, between um, between those um, two regimes and how they might they might, um, um, they might uh, converge or how um, in armed conflict situations if one would um, apply for instance a human rights law um, how that would um, deal with um, some of the practicalities and the realities um, under um, arising um, from armed conflict situations.